How many of us really paid attention in our 8th grade U.S. history class? I know I didn't. Social studies was definitely not my strong suit, but I also think that at that age, it was hard for me to truly appreciate the consequences of a topic like war. And specifically for today's episode, we'll be discussing the consequences and aftermath of the Vietnam War, consequences that many are still suffering with even decades later. Between 1961 and 1971, the U.S. sprayed 12 million gallons of dioxin-contaminated Agent Orange and 8 million gallons of other herbicides on Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. That's an average of 5,200 gallons a day for 3,735 days. All three countries suffered an additional tragedy from 7 million tons of bombs and other explosives. Together, Agent Orange and explosive remnants of war left a legacy of destruction, death, and sickness. Today, I get to share a conversation I had with the daughter of a Vietnam War veteran, Susan Hammond. She first became interested in post-war Southeast Asia after traveling to Vietnam and Cambodia in 1991. In 1996, after earning her MA in international education from NYU, Susan returned to Vietnam to study Vietnamese. She then became involved in fostering mutual understanding between the people of the U.S. and Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, and addressing the long-term impacts of war while working as the deputy director of the Fund for Reconciliation and Development from 1996 to 2007. During this time, she lived in New York, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, coordinating programs for FRD. In 2007, Susan returned to her home state of Vermont and founded the War Legacies Project. And in 2019, she received the Vietnam Order of Friendship Medal for her more than two decades of work in Vietnam. In this conversation, I asked her questions like, what exactly is Agent Orange and Dioxin? What were they used for during the war? And why? What were the health hazards that we discovered after the war? And how is it still affecting people to this day? What is her organization, the War Legacies Project, doing to serve those who were affected in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia? This is a conversation where I hope helps us appreciate our history and reflect on how we can be better in the future. My name is Hethel Bauman. And this is The Global Health Pursuit. Susan, I'm really grateful to talk to you today. I think it's a topic that is so important for all Americans to know about and just people around the world. It's something that I myself almost I feel like guilty for not knowing about this, you know. And so before before we dive in, I really would love for you to kind of take us back to when you were younger. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your story? Okay. Well, I grew up in Vermont for the most part, but I'm an army brat. So for the first eight years of my life, I traveled. um, I lived in upstate New York, uh, Okinawa, Japan, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and then here in Vermont. Um, I'm the sixth of eight children. So, oh, wow. yeah, <laughs> big family. <laughs> I grew up in a very big family and I just envisioned my mother as she took six of us and me in her arms as an infant on the airplane alone from California wow. to Okinawa, Japan, to meet up with my father who was stationed there. My father served two tour- tours in Vietnam. So my real memory of my father was not until probably when I was about five, when he came back after his second tour, because his first tour, I was only, I was only three at the time. And then he came back when I was almost six for his second tour. So that's my first sort of memory of, of my father. Um, 
he then retired from the military and we settled back into Vermont where I lived until high school. After I graduated high school, I went to Smith College down in Massachusetts. I thought I was going so far away. It was only a mile away. I mean, an hour away. But originally, I really thought I was going to be a pediatrician. I was really interested in medicine, really interested in children. And so that's what I started my college career um, as a biology major. But then organic chemistry just kicked my butt. And I thought, you oh, know, my God, tell me about it. <laughs> tell me, me about it. Yeah, I, I actually I was thinking about going to medical school in college and I this is just like a side. A couple of my my college mates, they took OCHEM. We called it OCHEM at RPI mm-hmm. for some reason. And they'd come back and be like, I got a 15% and I made the curve. Like, what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> I know. I started out gangbusters and then by mid-semester, it got harder and harder. And I'm like, is this what I really want to do? And I got to think, well, it's actually the kids that are really were interesting me. So maybe yeah. I'll go into education. So then I switched majors and went into education until I discovered after college, when I first was going to start teaching that actually it happened, you know, when I was doing my student teaching that I became so focused on the kids in the classroom were having learning disabilities that I lost the whole class. I mean, it was chaos. And I realized, wow. you know, I don't think I'm going to be a very good classroom teacher. So then I, my first job I was going to take was working with kids with autism until a friend of mine called me up and said, hey, I'm going to Germany for, the, for a year. You want to come with me? And I said, sure. <laughs> Yes, Yes. let's go. (laughs) I went. And that sort of led me on on an international career in a lot of ways. I just decided, you know, I really like this international work. So I came back from that work for a while and convinced my sister to do a bicycle trip around the world with me. So for 18 months, we traveled through Eastern, mainly Eastern Europe, parts of Europe. Then we hopped on a plane and went to India and Nepal and Indonesia and Malaysia. and, And I ended up in Bangkok. And as luck would have it, when you're on these traveling, you know, worldly traveling, you always meet the same people. We kind of overlap. And yeah, I was really wanted to go to Vietnam on this trip because I really wanted to understand what was about this country of Vietnam, you know, smaller than the state of California that took my father away from me for five years, basically of my life when I was a child. And it just opened up to foreign tourists. This was in 1991. And a guy that we kept meeting on the trip happened to be walking down the street in Bangkok. And I thought he had left for the States long ago. And he had just had his ticket in his hand to go to Vietnam. And I said, I'm going. My sister didn't really want to go because we're at the end of our trip. I Mm -hmm. said, tough. I'm going. If you don't want to come, don't. And she did in the end. And we had a great two months in Cambodia and Vietnam. And that was my first sort of experience of what a post-war country looked like, what it felt like. Even t- now at this point, it was 16 years after the end of the war in Vietnam. I mean, you still saw the devastation um, of the war in that country. You saw the deep poverty that not only the war caused, but because the U.S. was still had a trade and economic embargo against Vietnam at the time. So we would see kids like jumping off the edge of a bridge into the river to pick up scraps of fruits and vegetables that the vendors had been throwing over the bridge because they were too poor, you know, they were too bad quality to sell. But kids right. were scavenging this stuff. And this is in the in Saigon, you know, a major city. Right. And you could still see bombed out areas of the country, buildings with bullet holes, beggars on the streets, missing limbs. I mean, it was really sort of eye opening to see. I mean, I saw the poverty of India of course, when I was on the trip, but the poverty of a post-war nation was, um, for some reason, much more harder to take because we were responsible for a lot. We, meaning the U.S. government, were responsible for a lot of that impact that was still being felt in 1991. And so I knew at the time I had to find some way to get back to Vietnam to work. And eventually, after going to NYU for grad school, I volunteered for an organization called the Fund for Reconciliation Development that was based in New York, That, but that was working to normalize relations between Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam after the war to encourage the U.S. to end the embargoes. 
and to address some of the war legacies that were affecting the country. And I volunteered with them. Then I went to Vietnam to study Vietnamese, thinking I would do a PhD and ended up getting offered a job full time with the Fund for Reconciliation mm-hmm. Development. And there went my PhD plans and I started <laughs> working for them. And I did that for 10 years, doing programs to foster relations between the two countries. And I became really engaged um, while I was working for FRD on war legacy issues. <clears throat> and then long story short, in 2007, when my boss decided to focus mainly on Cuba because we had normalized relations at that point with Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And I was deeply engaged in the war legacy issues. I took that whole portfolio, moved back home to Vermont, and founded the War Legacies Project. The term war legacies, how would you describe that term? Like, How would you define what war legacies means? Yeah, it can be a large concept in a lot of ways. For me and for my work, it's the remains of the the impacts on human health, um, society, and the land after a war, and what what those what the remains are war. What happens, you know, after the bombing stops, but the war impacts are still impacting the country. <clears throat> so, for Southeast Asia specifically, it means the impacts of unexploded ordnance, uh, cluster bombs, remaining bombs, you know, even some large 500 pound, 700 pound bombs that did not explode that are still littering the countryside today, and the impacts of Agent Orange. Right. So I'm just going to read a paragraph off of your website, warlegacies.org. If you haven't seen this website, I'm going to put it in the show notes. But Here goes. Between 1961 and 1971, the U.S. sprayed 12 million gallons of dioxin-contaminated Agent Orange and 8 million gallons of other herbicides on Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, an average of 5,200 gallons a day for 3,735 days. My God. All three countries suffered an additional tragedy from 7 million tons of bombs and other explosives together, Agent Orange and explosive remnants of war, of war left a legacy of destruction, death and sickness. I, I mean, that's, you know, in a nutshell, like what, what you can even say happened during those 10 years. Yeah. That is something that's like so shocking. I think as, as the, daughter of a U.S. Vietnam War veteran, like when did you start to really learn about all of these, all of the impacts of this war? It was actually quite late because, you know, my father, when he came home for the war, just like many veterans, never spoke at all about the war and what he did there. I mean, he was in the Army Corps of Engineers. He wasn't in combat. So we always assumed, oh, he's fine. He's, he's not impacted because he's not He's not a combatant ground, veteran, right? I mean, but he was actually, I found out much later, years later that he was, he was in charge of all the army installations and roads and bridges in the Northern part of the South Vietnam. And so he was constantly out in the environment and in some dangerous situations. It's just, you know, he never told his, his family, you know, and wanted right. to have, you know, widow my mother with at that point, seven kids. So. I never really thought much about the war. I saw bits and pieces of it on the television. Of course, it was very U.S. focused, you know, what was happening to our veterans, not so much what was happening um, to people in in Vietnam. So it really wasn't until that trip in 1991 where I was really confronted with the, the impacts of the war directly. And I saw for myself that even though the war had ended 15 years earlier, you were still seeing people who were injured by unexploded ordnance that was still littering the littering the ground. And you were still, I didn't see as much impacts of Agent Orange on that first trip, but you clearly saw people missing limbs, missing limbs, children who were severely injured, just begging on the streets. And that's when I, you kind of, it really hit me that, wow, the war is still impacting people today. In fact, since the war over 100,000 Vietnamese have died from these unexploded ordnance, over 65,000 Cambodians, and over 50,000 Lao 
since the end of the war, since 1975. In fact, four children were injured, well, two who died just last two weeks ago in Laos when they came across an unexploded ordinance. Um, what is that? Can you like paint a picture of that? Where is, is, are these explosives like in the ground and you just kind of walk over it and it just ha- ha- explodes or like? It depends on what it is. I mean, for, for instance, in, in Laos, a lot of the problem there are what's called cluster bombs. In fact, that's what we just sent to Ukraine to use, right? In that war. And cluster bombs are small bombs about the size of a, a tennis ball that are in a much larger bomb casing. And in theory, when the plane drops this cluster bomb, it opens, the canister opens up and it spreads these smaller bomblets outside the the cluster, you know, the um, mother bomb, they call it. Right. And they are supposed to spread out in a large area, like a couple football fields area and explode. Well, they had about a 30 to 40 percent failure rate, depending where they landed. So that left millions and millions of these unexploded cluster bomblets literally, literally littering the whole countryside. Over time, you know, they would get turned and they could work their way down in the soil. Some are right on the surface that you could walk and see them. And others got buried underneath the ground over time, the rains and the muds and whatnot. Right, right, right. And so people who are farming would hit, could hit them with their hoe and then it would explode on impact. Sometimes you could pick one up and it would explode right away. And kids early on, before they were educated not to touch these small bomblets, they would play with them thinking they were toys. Oh my God. I mean, it was horrible. And then after a certain amount of time, their luck ran out and it would explode. I mean, that's why the uh, you know, two thirds of the casualties of these cluster bombs and other unexploded ordnance are children because they come across these remnants of war, right. not knowing what they are sometimes and sadly becoming casualties. So that's one side of the equation. The other mm-hmm. side is Agent Orange. So yeah. can you explain what was Agent Orange used for and I believe the the chemical composition was dioxin, or that's the name of the of the chemical. Actually, the chemical is uh, Agent Orange was one of many herbicides that the U.S. Okay. military used during the war. They they called them tactical herbicides because they were in much higher concentrations than the type of herbicides you may spray on your farm here back in in the U.S. or use to kill your poison ivy. So they were. There are several different types that, you know, they, they, they're nicknamed the rainbow herbicides of which Agent Orange was one. And Agent Orange is two, a mixture of 50-50 mixture of two herbicides. One is 2,4,5-T and the other is 2,4-D. And 2,4-D is still used today widely across the world and particularly across the U.S. And it's also, if you go, for instance, to your hardware store to get Roundup to kill that poison ivy, right, it, right. Mm-hmm. Has, it has 2,4,5, 2,4-D in it. 2,4,5-T, the other half of Agent Orange, was contaminated during the manufacturing process with dioxin. So what happened was the chemical companies, when they were making these herbicides for the U.S. government, would create the chemical reaction at too high of a speed, too high of a temperature, and the end result was dioxin would be created, the molecule dioxin, specifically something called TCDD dioxin. I won't get into the longer name of that. (laughs) So long, it probably won't be much, but you can Google it. And that is is one of the persistent organic pollutants that do not leave. They have a very, very long um, half-life, half-life once they're in the environment and it's highly, highly toxic. And people tend to say that it's, you know, one of the most highly toxic chemicals created by man because it's created in the burning process or in the manufacture of chemicals. So it's it's not naturally, well, it's in the environment because of burning but right. um, or chemical manufacturing, but it's highly, highly toxic. So that was one of the problems with Agent Orange. And Agent Orange was, and all the other chemicals, were sprayed throughout all of South Vietnam, parts of Cambodia, and a large part of southern Laos, and and also sprayed around military bases in Thailand that the U.S. was using. And the purpose 
was to defoliate the trees that were making the locations of the enemy camps and enemy soldiers hard for the U.S. to see, hard for them to bomb because they couldn't see where these camps were. They couldn't see where the roads were. So they would defoliate the trees. But another purpose of the herbicides was crop destruction. They, they purposely went after crops that were being raised, thinking that the, you know, their, their reasoning was that it would prevent the enemy forces from getting access to the crops. But they really were killing the crops of, of Vietnamese and Lao and Cambodian people in, in that effort. And not even just like targeting like soldiers or people like that. It was just across the board. Yeah, because they considered basically all of Laos along the Ho Chi Minh Trail and majority of Vietnam as enemy territory because it was that type of war. There wasn't set sort of like boundary points of, you know, here's the end of the war zone. It was the whole part. And so they they destroyed and defoliated about this what would be the size of, of land equivalent to, say, Vermont, the size of that. That's um, completely defoliated um, and crops destroyed. A lot of that land was, to, I mean, it didn't naturally regenerate. And we're talking about, you know, Asian tropical forests, triple canopies with bamboos and lots of underlayers and then these gigantic teak trees and, you know, beautiful forest land that was defoliated. And then as a result of that, the heavy monsoons would erode the soil away. The, the hot sun would cake, uh, you know, bake it dry like concrete. Um, really depleted the nutrients of the soil. I mean, today the Vietnamese have made efforts to replant um, trees in this area, but they can never bring back the natural forest that was there. It would be way too expensive. So what they have is plantations of acacia and eucalyptus trees just to protect protect the land, basically, from eroding away even more. But it was what wasn't known at the time, or at least it wasn't widely known to the military that these chemicals, the 245T part of Agent Orange was contaminated with dioxin. The chemical companies knew. Mm. They knew back in the 50s when they first started making the herbicides that dioxin, if you don't make them properly by keeping the temperature low and making the chemical reaction happen more slowly, dioxin is a, is a contaminant, a byproduct. They didn't tell the U.S. government that. And they were selling 20 million gallons of herbicides, of which 12 million specifically was Agent Orange. So um, they knew. They knew. The chemical companies knew when they were selling these chemicals to the U.S. It was contaminated with dioxin. So this is in the you know late 60s, early late 60s, part of the early 70s. What they did not know was that the full extent of the health impacts of dioxin. They knew it caused a severe skin reaction called chloroacne to, to their workers because they were dealing with that in their factories. But they did not know at the time the long-term health impacts that we now know that dioxin causes on, on humans. We now know that it's, it's, a, it's considered dioxin is a um, cancer-causing agent. This is many different types of cancers. It's been linked to Parkinson's disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. Um, right now, the VA compensates U.S. veterans for 19 different classes of, of um, illnesses and cancers that they have found to be associated to their exposure to, Viet to Agent Orange during their time in Vietnam. Also, in animal studies... And dioxin is really complicated on how it impacts human health. I mean, it's it's a hormone mimicking chemical, so it interrupts how how your body reacts. You know how how hormones act in your body if you're exposed to dioxin. And so it's there's been lots and lots of animal studies. Of course, you can't poison a human being with dioxin and see what their end results are. And first of all you'd have to poison millions of people to follow their health and their children's health and their grandchildren's health over time. And so a little unethical, a little unethical <laughs> and also not feasible. So all the studies on dioxin have been done on animals, of course, on, on mice. Right. Um, and that's when they first really learned the, the long-term impacts. In fact, the, the impacts on reproduction were first noticed when 
because Agent Orange was also used domestically in the forest out west to control the undergrowth. And foresters started coming across frogs that were severely deformed after they started oh, wow. using agent the sim, the two chemicals, 245T and 24D. That's when they connected to like, oh, there's something else going on here. It's not yeah. just for acne. There are longer other impacts, including reproductive impacts from dioxin. So you had said that after spraying, it kind of it goes into the soil. How you said that there's it's a very, very long half life. Mm -hmm. And since the time that it started they sprayed, like what is is there like a prediction of like when it actually will be gone from the soil? Or because it's been Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode. And if you are, would you do me a tiny favor? Show me some love by doing one or more of these three things. A, click the support this podcast link in the description to donate a few dollars toward the production of this podcast. My dream is to do this full time and your support would mean the world. B, you can write me a review on Apple Podcasts and or rate me on Spotify to give me a boost in the algorithm. Or C, share this episode with someone who would love it just as much as you do. I truly and deeply appreciate you. Let's get back to the episode. Yeah, there actually is, because studies have been done by a group in Canada called the Hatfield Consultants. They're an environmental group that's experts on the dioxins through, you know, the creation of dioxins from um, making paper. It's another way that dioxins are created in Canada. So they went to Vietnam in the mid 1990s and they, they decided they wanted to test the theory of, you know, how, where is the dioxin today? What right. are the impacts today? And so they tested the areas of the country that were sprayed by airplane and they thankfully did not find high levels of dioxin in the soil, in the areas that were sprayed by airplane. Makes sense because, you know, at that point, it was 20 years after the end of the war. Right. There was, they are talking about 20 years of monsoonal rains it would move the soil, move the dioxin. It's it likely... Um, and thankfully, dioxin is water soluble. It's stored in, or it clings to the soil. And so you would not find it like a contaminated well that was sprayed. So they, they theorized that, you know, over the year, the um, dioxin migrated through the heavy monsoons. Possibly the dioxin can be broken down by sunlight. So if it was right on the soil surface, it would be broken down by the sun into harmless particles. Um, so thankfully, they found in the area sprayed by airplane, there were not high rates of, of, of dioxin. It's basically the same level you would find in anywhere. I mean, you find dioxin basically everywhere because we're an industrialized society, right? You know, when you're burning things, you create dioxin. But so they did not find it above the normal back, what they call normal background level. But what they found was on the former military bases, the bases where the barrels were stored, where the herbicides were moved from the barrels into the airplanes, or where they were repeatedly sprayed around the perimeter of the base. They did find high levels of dioxin there. In fact, some of the highest levels found anywhere in the world are in, in Vietnam, because when you have 20 million gallons and they're stored in 55 gallon drums, that's a lot of spillage that happens. And it settled down in the soil. And so they went down to three meters and they could still spine dioxin at three meters down. Um, oh, wow. And so they found that really in Vietnam, there are three major sites of dioxin contamination today, well, at the time. And that was the Da Nang Air Base, the Binh Hoa Air Base, and the Phu Cot Air Base, where planes were loaded and millions of barrels of these herbicides were stored. And that's what are still, well, Da Nang is now cleaned up, but there's still contamination today in the process of being cleaned up from 50, well, 60 plus years ago. How does one clean that up? 
it's a very expensive, time consuming process. And um, if it was like yeah. not heavily contaminated by that, I mean, you might have under a thousand parts per trillion of of dioxin. And that's a hard concept to understand what a part per trillion is. Basically, one part per trillion is a drop of water in an Olympic sized swimming pool. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't that hard to sort of wrap your head around? And so, and we're talking a thousand. So that's a thousand drops in a, in a swimming pool causes significant impacts that you cannot live on that. You have to move the population off. So we're talking small, small, small particles that have a huge, huge, huge impact because of these cancers and potential breaks that they cause if if you're exposed to them. Um, and the, how you get exposed is by eating contaminated food, mainly animals. That is grown on that land. Okay. Yes. And that bio, bio it, it doesn't, thankfully it doesn't go in plants. Oh, because it, doesn't. it doesn't. Okay. No, it, the only thing is of all things, the zucchini family and water locusts are the two things that, yes, but because it's fat soluble, the way that it accumulates is animals eat, you know, eat the soil, get contaminated in the soil that they're on. They, they eat particles of soil. Then it just bioaccumulates up the food chain um, until, you know, you may eat a piece of fish. Well, actually the fat of a fish, because uh, fat is a popular source of, of nutrition, you know, particularly mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia, you eat the fatty parts of the fish, then that they can be highly contaminated. And then you ingest the fish or the ducks, and then it goes into your body. Um, and the v they were finding, you know, populations who were living around the air bases with thousands of parts per trillion of, of dioxin in their blood because they had been living off the land, off the animals that were eating off of those contaminated soils. Um, but thankfully it was contained in Vietnam. It's been found to be contained to these former air bases. So that is one thing where you can control exposure to dioxin is by not eating the food that's raised, meaning the, the ducks, the fish, the cows on this contaminated soil. And so they could cordon off these areas. And then you have to go through this process of cleaning up by removing the contaminated soil and how they, the U.S. government is actually funding this right now. It's one of the things they're doing in their uh, post-war support for war legacies is helping Vietnam to clean up Da Nang, which is completed, and the Binh Hoa base. And they the process that they're using is to dig up the soils and they put them in a, the plan at least, I mean, what they did in Da Nang was put it in basically a gigantic oven. It's like two football fields long, you know, 50 meters high oven that they just heated up the soil to the temperature where that chemical reaction that created dioxin then breaks it dissipates. down and it dissipates. And then they, they can get rid of the soil and bury it to, or in a, in a smaller site where you don't have as high rates of dioxin, um, you can just cap it, put it in a concrete shell, basically, and cover it with concrete to make sure that it doesn't get into, can't move through the groundwater and settle into sediment. Um, you just contain it. So that's some ways that they're also managing it. Wow. I just can't, I, like you said, I can't wrap my head around the one drop, <laughs> I know. you know, the one drop. Oh, my goodness. Wow. When I heard that, I said that can't be possible. And then I, you know, it's like, of course, you Google it and Google it to get confirmation. And yeah, that's basically the the uh, one way to, to visualize it. It's it's just incredible. And what that one drop can do is amazing because it does. It causes it mimics the processes in our body. Um, and so it interferes with those. It, it mimics hormones. So it interferes with the processes in our body that are supposed to be, um, you know, for, you know, our uh you know, reproduction or creating healthy cells or any of those processes, um, all different. In fact, there's the best person, if you want to, anyone wants to go into the real details of what dioxin can do is to um, Google a woman named Linda Birnbaum. She used to be the head of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and she's since retired and is now um, at Duke University 
and she is the expert on dioxin. And she has a video. In fact, it's on our, our website. We sites. One is agentorangerecord.com. And then another one is the warlegacies.org site. And on the Agent Orange Record site is a video that Linda just goes through the whole steps of this is dioxin. This is what it does. This is how it can cause how it problems. spreads. And it's mm. yes. And how it, you know, impacts the reproductive system, the, the circulatory system, the I mean, every system in your body. And they found this by studying animals because that's how you how you understand that. And and as she explains you know, if you find, you know, one, one chemical that only impacts one animal and only picks one system of that animal, then you can't easily say, okay, this would, you'll see the same results in humans. Yeah. But because every animal studied, every system in that animal studied is impacted by a dioxin, then you can make that sort of assumption. leap to yeah. assumption of, of what it can do to humans. And there are, the only way you can sort of look at these studies, you know, look at what dioxin does in the human population is looking at epidemiological studies. Mm -hmm. And that has been done by looking at veterans, by looking at populations that were exposed, like chemical workers, areas where there were chemical accidents, like in Seveso, um, Italy, where you can see, you know, over time what the health impacts have been. And this is how Really, the VA has developed this list of the 19 cancers and diseases that they now will compensate veterans if they're if they come down with um, one of those conditions because of their exposure to Agent Orange. And just to be clear, though, like to have effects, to, to actually see the effects of Agent Orange, you actually didn't have to be there during that time, right? You can be a grandchild of. Mm -hmm one of these. Yeah. Yeah. It, particularly when it comes to the reproductive impacts. And that's where there's still a lot of scientific debate is like, how does dioxin cause multi-generational impacts? And what is now being looked at is in the study of epigenetics, which is, um, it's not like changes in your DNA, but it's cha changes in the epigenetic layer of the DNA that kind of tells the genes what to do, when to turn on, when to turn off, when yeah. to um, create this process. Um, and so it's that level that they they believe dioxin is has, having impacts when, when you're supposed to, um, this part of development is supposed to happen, you know, in the fetus, the dioxin that changed the epigenetics of the grandmother so it's not spelt in, you know, the impact was on the grandmother exposed and it created some epigenetic change and actually probably the grandfather changes that. And then, the, or for instance, the mother who was, you know, um, a young child, you know, a, a fetus in the womb at the time, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's complicated in that it's, there's obviously different pathways between a female and a male exposure to dioxin and how it would, would cause impacts on the child or the grandchild. But anyway, what happens is the change is at that epigenetic layer and that's transmitted down to the next generation. And you may not see the impact on that first generation. You may not see it till the second generation. Um, oh, wow. And okay. that's what they're starting, starting through these epigenetic studies to see is that the impacts can go down through many, many generations. So you can get, if you're exposed directly yourself to dioxin, then you're likely, you could get the cancers, you could get the Parkinson's, you could get these other diseases. Or you could have a child born with spina bifida, for instance, or some of the other birth defects. But you may not see those impacts until they're your grandchild or your great-grandchild even. And that's what they're now seeing in the population in, in Vietnam, where they compare areas of the country that were sprayed versus not sprayed. So population sprayed versus population not sprayed. And they see higher rates of birth defects and disabilities um, in the populations where the herbicides were sprayed than in populations that were not sprayed. And, and particularly um, birth defects that have, you know, neural tube defects, I know I things. saw some photos like on yeah. on the article that you sent me where like some of the children's legs are just like permanently contracted and like yeah. can't extend and I was reading that some some babies were born without eyes like mm -hmm. wow I'm... yeah 
Yeah. And you see that you see that type of birth effect in the animal studies. And now we're seeing them generations later in in human populations. But it's hard. It's, you know, like with anything, it's hard to say that any one individual right. has a birth effect because of their grandmother's exposure to Agent Orange. But overall, when you look at larger populations and again, when you look at animal studies, you clearly see that there is higher rates of these birth effects among populations that were sprayed. Right. So in terms of the U.S.'s involvement in Vietnam to kind of help reconciliate and clean up dioxin, is there anything else? Like, what are the other things that the U.S. is doing to kind of facilitate the relationship between the U.S. and Vietnam? Yeah, the war legacies issue is the um, sort of the main uh, drivers of strengthening the relations between Vietnam and the U.S. and to some extent Vietnam and, and Laos. In that, first of all, with regard to the unexploded ordnance side of the equation, they are funding the removal of unexploded ordnance through organizations that do that work. Um, they're funding mine risk education to to help children understand not to touch such you know these right. various. Um, items that they find in the soil. And they are funding some support to people who have suffered from accidents um, due to unexploded ordnance. On the Agent Orange side of things, since 2007, the U.S. has funded the cleanup of dioxin at the, the Da Nang Air Base mm-hmm. and now the Binh Hoa Air Base. And that's been over $300 million allocated by the U.S. government since 2007 for the cleanup process. And also part of that is to educate the population in, who live around these air bases not to eat content, you know, soy, uh, animals that could be contaminated with dioxin. Um, on the human health side of the, the impact on you know, people with disabilities that are assumed to be associated to exposure to Agent Orange. And in fact, the U.S. doesn't agree necessarily that, you know, that all the disabilities in Vietnam are caused by Agent Orange. And um, because, again... Their, their portfolio is to just provide services to people with disabilities, regardless of the cause. But through advocacy that I have done and others I work with, we have been able to get the funding focused on those areas that were heavily sprayed by Agent Orange. And so the target is eight provinces that were sprayed with Agent Orange and the other herbicides during the war and targeting people with disabilities that are quite severe um, that could be associated with Agent Orange. And so primarily what that looks like is rehabilitation services. So they have been training speech pathologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists in Vietnam. They go in and help train parents on how to better care for their child, particularly those with a severe disability that are unfortunately unable to go to school, who are pretty much full-time bed bound. So there's programs that the fund U.S. is supporting mainly through HI, uh, which used to be Handicap International, but it's now called Humanity and Inclusion. So they go in and they provide training for the Vietnamese. There are also some programs helping just the Vietnamese um, develop their policy on disabilities and their law on disabilities so that buses are accessible, buildings are accessible, children with disabilities go to actually do go yeah. to school. You know, when I first started this work in the 90s, if you had a child with a disability, you were not going to you were not going yeah, to school, right. even if even if it was relatively minor. In fact, one girl that we've been supporting for oh God, since she was pre-K we had to fight to let the pre-K school accept her. And she was born without arm, uh, arms that ended at her elbow and her two legs or one is fe- severely deformed. So she couldn't walk. She scoots around on her on a little scooter. Mm. Um, but we had to force the school to accept her. And then then once she went to preschool, we had to force the elementary school to accept her, even though it was the law. So that that was back in the early you know, 2000s. Now the Vietnamese are really making efforts to make sure that um, children with disabilities do access school. In fact, this young girl is now in the ninth grade and still wants to be a doctor. She's quite a firecracker. (laughs) She's really amazing and very smart. And when somebody asked her, well, how can you be a doctor if you have no arms? And she'd say, well, 
I have a nurse for that. She can help me. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> My gosh. She sounds, she sounds like a fun one. She is a fun one. She's, she's something else. But so the U S is funding projects like that right now. And it's about, um, over since 2007, they've provided over $400 million for these programs. But, you know, what we advocate for is, yes, the medical side of things is very important to help people physically, to help them get medical care, but not, sadly, not all people with disabilities at this point, rehabilitation, it's, it's too little too late for right, so many right. of them. Um, so we advocate that they help um, these families with their you know, nutrition and income generation so that they can, you know, care for their children in a, in a house that's the roof doesn't leak, um, that the able, the children who are not disabled in their family are able to go to school. So we provide scholarships for them as well so that they can, so that the whole family can provide the best care possible for their loved one who has quite severe disability. That is, um, sadly not, they, they need 24 our care to meet their needs. And so we're encouraging the U.S. to try to do a little bit more of that type of support as well. Not, I mean, it's great that they're helping children with disabilities go to school and get a job, but don't lose out. Don't forget those with the much more severe cases that sadly very little can be done, but they're still right. heavily right. impacting their families. And what about the, the U.S. veterans that have been affected as well? Yeah. I mean, for them, um, over time, through their basically fighting the VA system, they've been able to get more and more of these conditions that they're they're suffering from recognized by the VA. And there's now, um, as I said, these 19 what are called presu presumptive conditions that, again, has been shown by scientific studies to be linked to either Agent Orange or, two for, or dioxin or, or one of the other chemicals used. But they still have, if they're not on one of those that don't have the condition, one of those 19 conditions, but they feel that their cancer that's, you know, not on the list is related to their time in Vietnam, they still have to fight for recognition from the VA for that. And children of Vietnam veterans receive absolutely no support from the U.S. government. The only condition that the VA recognizes as being associated to um, the father's exposure to Agent Orange during the war is spinal bifida. If you were the child of a female veteran, of which there's only like 8,000 females who served in Vietnam, there's a much longer list of birth uh, birth defects that the VA will provide compensation for, but they say it's for service in Vietnam for exposure to Agent Orange. Um, but so if you're a child of a male veteran with um, a, another, like a missing limb, like, like this young girl that I work with in Vietnam, um, you get absolutely no support from the, from the U S government for that because they don't, they don't, the VA doesn't recognize that dioxin can have multi-generational impacts through the male's exposure. But they say that, well, they would give support through the woman's exposure. Gotcha. Yes. I see. Yes. Okay. But for their time in Vietnam, not specifically for Agent Orange. So that makes you think, so, okay, what was it in the environment for the females that it's not for the males? You know, it, it's, I mean, of course there's, you know, different processes of which exposure can harm a fetus, um, depending, but, but still you think, you know, what may, it actually just makes absolutely no sense. It's, it's very, um, for me, you know, <laughs> yeah. it makes no sense that yes, you can, but only, you know, only, only through the male is it spinal bifida. So. Oh, hmm. interesting. Yeah. So we're going to wrap it up, but I do have some closing questions. So the, the U S manufacturers within the US are still creating this chemical they're creating 24D 24D which is okay. yeah which was the half of agent orange the 245T was the US military stopped using it in 1971 i think it was 70 or 71 um, when they discovered that dioxin was a contaminant chemical companies finally sort of fessed up to it. Oh yeah, there's dioxin in this. Um, and then they found out that it was causing, could cause these 
serious health impacts. They stopped using Agent Orange uh, before the war ended. But it, it wasn't until 19, I want to say 1979 or even later, that they stopped allowing the 245T to be used in the United States. So it was still used after the war in the United States for about a decade. Um, then it was banned completely um, by the U.S. So you could no longer produce 245T or use it in, in um, agriculture or, or forest or wherever you would use it. But 24D is still produced and still used today in agriculture and still used in people's backyards. You know, like dandelions. Yeah. That's like the thing that you said. Yeah. Right. Roundup. That's yeah. So it's still that's but and then that so 24D you, is also shown in scientific studies to have some health impacts. But I mean, it is also shown to cause health problems, but not it's not as con- much of a contaminant as uh, or toxic as dioxin itself. Dioxin was not produced um, at high rates when they created 24D herbicide, only when they created the 245T herbicide because the chemicals involved in the combination to make the herbicide. Are there some things that we need to stay clear of? Like don't buy Roundup? <laughs> don't buy Roundup. I mean, I have my, I live in Vermont. I have about three acres and a lots of it is con- has poison ivy everywhere. And I refuse, refuse to use Roundup. In fact, I pull it and I give myself poison ivy every spring because I'm like a fool pulling it by hand. But <laughs> You need to like dress up at like, you know, put a bunny suit on and then pull I everything. Do, and I, it yeah. still sneaks in. It still sneaks in. <laughs> so yeah, do not use, um, do not use pesticides in general. Um, stay away from the persistent organic pollutants. I mean, we're fine. I mean, my high school right now is being closed part of it because of PFAS, you know, another contaminant that was, you know, widely used. And it was in, in all types of construction materials in the seventies. Here we are 50 years later, my school was built in nine, you know, 56 years ago, and they have to close a majority of the school down because of the chemicals that were used at the time. So be really careful. I mean, that's my advice. You need chemicals are everywhere. It's hard right. to it's hard to stay away from them all. But but do your research and find out what is look at the ingredient list. Look at the ingredient list and, you know, I, I know it's hard to eat organic, but as much as you can. Do you know that that I just watched a Netflix documentary. Um it was called Poisoned and mm-hmm. it talks about all these like you know, the farms that the romaine lettuce is grown in yeah. and the different meats and all of that and where salmonella comes from. It makes me want to go vegetarian, but then at the same time, like lettuce also produce. It's like, what do <laughs> I, I do? Oh my God. I'm, it's, I'm like, what do I eat? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. But of course, the good thing is a lot of these chemicals are, you know, research them because a lot of them, they're not water soluble. So if you clearly wash your vegetables, um, right. Ideally we'll be getting rid of a lot of those contaminants, but I mean, it's, 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 you can get sort of really deep into like worrying about everything, which we are so surrounded by chemicals that is, it, it's hard to avoid hard anything to avoid. that's obvious. Avoid anything avoid that's anything obvious. obvious. <laughs> yes, exactly. that's really good. Yeah, Susan, yeah. this was so good and so informative. I do want to ask you one last question: How can we support your work with War Legacy? Yeah, well, I mean, what we do, we provide direct support to people with disabilities and their families in Vietnam and Laos. And so what that looks like really depends on their needs. And and some, particularly in Laos, it's helping people get access to medical care. Um, Because unlike in Vietnam, where there's a well-developed medical care system, a child born with a disability, a birth defect, I should say, usually gets help pretty much right away. Um, If left lip, a foot, or or some type of condition that can be medically corrected through surgery, they get that surgery. In Laos, that does not happen. They do not have access to that type of simple medical care. And so we provide a lot of support to families like that. Um, so on our on our website, if you want to 
provide some medical support to a fam a child in Laos or Vietnam. You can donate and it, that money will get 100% to that family who has that need. In Vietnam, we provide, we, we focus mainly with those children who have severe, severe disabilities, whose families are very poor. And we, we do income generation programs with them or provide that scholarship for their sibling who can go to school, who will be the child who will be caring for their disabled family member when their parents die, sadly. Um, so we, we provide some economic support to them. It could be helping them purchase a cow that they can breed mm -hmm. or fixing their roof or starting up a small business is that that type of support. If you're in the medical professional world and have specific knowledge about some of these conditions that we come across, you know, right now, particularly, you know, things like heart defects or severe birth defects, um, you know, that impact multiple parts of, of the human, you know, you know, something not, not as simple, like the Vietnamese, for instance, can handle cleft lips and cleft palates. That's not right. the problem, but um, more complex conditions. If you're willing to go on a medical mission and, you know, encourage your, your institution to get involved in some of these medical missions, that would be great. So there's many things that, and, and just raising awareness about um, the long-term impacts of war. And, and particularly when I, I think of, you know, for Agent Orange, hopefully that will never be repeated, but we're repeating right now cluster munitions in Ukraine. Um, the U.S. is funding, uh, providing these same weapons, very similar weapons right now. Um, so if you don't think that that is something that should be done, speak up. <laughs> To, to prevent another generation of, of people to stumble across these weapons and, and sadly be killed, like those uh, two kids who were just killed two weeks ago in Laos, 50 years after that weapon was dropped. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your time, Susan. All of the information and resources will be provided on the show notes, so make sure you go check out the website and reach out to Susan, too, if you have any other questions. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to learn more about today's topic and guest, head over to the show notes linked in the description of this episode. There you can get access to resources, links, and ways you can get involved in the pursuit for global health. And if you love this episode, don't forget to write me a review on Apple Podcasts and rate the podcast on Spotify. It helps me get in front of more people just like you and continues to elevate the causes we are so passionate about. I'll see you in the next one.